Hallelujah. Glory to God. Welcome to Abundant Grace Wednesday night service. We are glad you're here, church family. We're glad you're here if you're visiting us for the first time. Um, happy to virtually see you. So if it is your first time here uh, on one of our live streams, whether it's a Wednesday night or Sunday night, maybe you've never been involved in any of our live stream or in-person services, let us know in the comment section. We want to say hello to you. We want to welcome you. Uh, I know there's people out there. I know our pastors, our elders, uh, their wives are all on uh, the live stream. They want to love on you guys. They want to say hello. And when these doors are open, they want to obviously uh, come meet you. We want you to come out and be part of one of our in-person services, with, which I absolutely believe is going to be happening very quickly. Amen. So if the way things are going, I think uh, people have had enough of staying home and most especially everybody wants to get back out to church. Amen. So we're going to just start off with some praise and worship tonight as usual. Um, so as I always say, every Wednesday, stand up on your feet at home, worship the Lord, let the things of today just kind of fade away. And uh, we're going to get into uh, praise and worship. And then we're going to get into the word of God. You should be excited because I'm excited. I'm excited uh, to wrap up the series. And I believe we're going to wrap it up. I say that it was only supposed to be two weeks we're on three um, but the series we've been doing these last couple of wednesday nights the 166 hours which led us into cultivating a lifestyle of christianity so we are gonna bring that home land the plane hopefully um, but holy spirit is the autopilot so whatever he says we're gonna do so uh, glory to God. So let's just open up in prayer and then we'll just get into some music and then we'll get started. So Father God, thank you for an opportunity for all of us to be here live stream where everybody's wherever anybody's watching this at home in their listening to it in their car wherever you're at we thank you father that nothing will stop the word of god from going forth and we thank you what the enemy went meant for our harm you are using it for our good and your glory and we thank you for supernatural ears to hear your word tonight hearts that are receptive and a and a willingness to put everything we're we're spending time with you tonight into practice and we thank you for it all in advance in jesus name amen who am i that the highest king would welcome me i was lost but he brought I'm a child of 
child of God. Yes, I am. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You're a child of God tonight. If you're in Christ, seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, you are a child of God. Glory to God. He is so good. Um, you know, when I opened up in prayer, I said what the devil meant for our harm, God would ultimately use for our good and his glory. And I didn't even realize that song, how it ties into it, right? You know, it, it's just so awesome. Um, doesn't matter what, what, you know, what came up in your life today, what tried to come against you in Christ, it is not allowed to stay unless you let it to. Amen. So glory to God. He is so, so good. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean sky. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your Glory to God. He is so, so good. You know, I hope you guys are really just listening to some of the words of these songs tonight and just letting them minister to you, you know. I can tell you from my own experience, today was not my favorite day of the world or the day of my life, and it was, uh, it was a challenge, you know. But the book of James is pretty explicit about letting us know that we are going to face challenges. So whatever you face today, you are an overcomer. Amen. So let this, let, we're going to receive our offering in two seconds here and then we'll play the song out and then we'll get into the word so just let it go release it you know i always tease my wife anytime she's holding on to something and she does the same thing to me that i just tell her look you just gotta release it you gotta give it over to god amen so um it's giving time so while we're in an attitude of worship and praise giving is all part of that so we have lots of ways you can sow into our ministry here at abundant grace church so if you text you can text your offering to 732-856-5050 uh, i always tell you this but for those of you who are new for the benefit of going through it again 
one time, the first time, you're going to have to set up your account, put in all your information. Once you do that, you are good moving forward. You can just always text your offering. Or you can visit us online, www.abundantgracechurch.com. Go to our giving tab, pull it down, same thing. Fill out your information, and um, you, you'll be good to go from then on. And, you know, every week I say this. I know Pastor Eddie's been saying it. Pastor Anthony's been saying it. But it bears repeating. God is supernaturally providing for so many of you out there that I, I know of. I've heard personal testimonies. Um, you know, me and Jody, when we get back in church, we'll probably share one of our own. But I know what God's been doing here at the church. And anytime we talk about giving, it's not because we're trying to get money out of you. Quite the opposite. We want to teach on giving so that each and every one of you has the experience that I know that I've had in my life is that God has shown us how to live abundantly ourselves inside our giving. You know, because God's principles of sowing or reaping are for today. You know, as the earth remains, seed time and harvest time, it's still continuing. And you can't reap a harvest without sowing a seed and then watering that seed. You got to take care of that seed. Amen. I, I don't know if I shared this with you guys last week or I was sharing it with somebody that I know that we're in a season of reaping and we're reaping seed that we planted, man, I don't know how many years ago. But God is always faithful to provide a crop. And us as believers do the harvesting, amen? So glory to God, that should give you enough time to type in your offering or text it over. Um, and let's just, uh, like I said, wrap up in one more song. We'll pray over the offering, then we'll go. Father God, thank you so much for an opportunity and a privilege to sow into your kingdom, Lord. I know the words I just spoke are true and alive and are producing right now in givers' lives that each and every seed that's sown here in faith into good soil here at AGC will produce for the sower. And I thank you, not only does your word promise us that you give us back equal, no, you would multiply the seed. Just like a farmer plants a tomato seed and gets a harvest of tomatoes, more tomatoes, more seed to sow. And we thank you for that in advance in Jesus' name, and you guys can all say amen out there and amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround. Deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. have chosen me, love has called my name, I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins, I'm no longer Use 
with the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer Hallelujah. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you're a child of God tonight? I think we've hit that a couple times tonight already. So, But it's good to remember that we are children of the Most High. Amen? All right. So glory to God. Let's shift gears a little bit. Let's get over to the Word and um, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your Word. Thank you for your Word being alive, sharper than any two-edged sword even to the division of joints and marrow and to the piercing and of our own hearts, Father. Your word is a discerner of the hearts of each and every one of us, Father. And I ask you tonight, Holy Spirit, point people into an area that they need to change. I just ask that you just saturate them right now with revelation knowledge of your word. And Lord, I say bring glory to yourself. And, and we know that's going to happen in the testimonies that are to come when we all congregate back together. And I thank you for the anointing that's on my life. And Lord, I surrender to that right now. I erase myself of my agenda and say, Holy Spirit, speak through me. And I thank you for that in advance, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Type amen. It's like shouting it. Type it in all caps. Amen. Uh, so glory to God. So a couple weeks ago, we started talking about the 166 hours. And really what that, if I could sum that up into a couple sentences, really what that was about was no excuses. We literally have no excuses for not spending time in fellowship, not spending time in the Word of God. And, you know, we've been looking at this over a couple weeks, and we kind of led into cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity, and that's where we're going to pick up at, at tonight. But I did really want to review, because there's some things I was noticing, and Pastor, if you remember two weeks ago when I started this series, something that he had posted during healing school bore witness with my spirit, you know, was confirmation of the same thing I was feeling. And really what that was, and I'm going to read Pastor's comment again on Facebook, and this was during a healing school service, was I've been noticing that as things are starting to loosen up, less people are watching. And he was specifically alluding to the live streams for both healing school, Wednesday night services, and Sunday night services. We need to remember not to get back in our old habits. We need to keep the word God first place in our lives. And that resonated with me because I was noticing the exact same stuff. And quite honestly, I'm still noticing it. I'm still seeing some numbers fall off a little bit in areas. And that's not a good thing. Now, I know many of you will catch up with the services. If you miss it on Sunday or you miss it on Wednesday night or you miss a healing school because of the convenience of Facebook live stream and our YouTube channel, you'll go back and watch it when it's convenient for you. But that's not good because the word of God tells us not forsaking our, the assembling of ourselves together. Now, you might say, well, we're not assembling together, but we are. When we're all together watching it as one body of believers on the live stream at the same time, I believe in my spirit that God showed me it's different than watching it by myself later on. Because we're all joined together in the spirit at the same time watching and listening to the Word of God. You know, and I got to be honest with you, I can't wait till we're back here, but in the meantime, we're watching services live. You know, you guys may see me jump in. I catch um, Healing School even though I'm working. I'll at least catch a part of every message every day. It would be a rare occasion where I didn't catch part of it. 
So I, I'm there for that. If I'm not minister on Wednesday night, you better believe I'm going to be watching it live. And I have not missed a Sunday morning service with Pastor Eddie since the coronavirus started. And, uh, you know, I plug in, me and Jody plug in our laptop because there's something wrong with the Chromecast on our television. And we watch it live on the television. Then I'm monitoring the feed, you know, so I can interact with anybody it needs interacting with. But we're watching it live all the time. Because to me, there's something that's happening when we're all joined in the spirit realm by faith, listening to the word of God together at the same time. The only excuse, and Jody knows it, it bugs me a little bit, that the live stream, like if I have it on my phone, I turn the volume down and I listen to it on the television, and there's anywhere from a four second to a 10 de second delay between those two, but we're all there together at the same time. Can you say amen? So the whole preface of the 166 hours was basically there's 168 hours in a week. If you, I gave everybody the benefit of the doubt of spending two times in two hours in a church service down to 166. And if you work 40 hours a week, I know many of you work more than that. This is a generalization. So if you work 40 hours a week, you sleep eight hours a night, that's 56 hours. That will leave you with 70 hours a week to make excuses why you can't spend time in the word, spend time in service, or spend time seeking God on your own. Amen. And really the bottom line, what it all came down to is there is no excuse. There really isn't. So, and I challenge anybody who see me, email me here at the church. Uh, what is my email here at the church? <laughs> I think I remember. What's it? My wife's saying it. No, I think it's uh, fmanetti at abundantgracechurch.com. There you go. You can email me if you tell me there's no way you can spend time in the Word, and I'd be happy to meet with you when we're open again, or I'll meet with you now, and we'll do a Zoom or whatever to, to Make sure that you understand there are no excuses. Amen. So that led us into cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity. And so many of us, including myself, growing up in denominational circles, went to church forsaking the personal intimate relationship side of Christianity for obligation instead. Well, what do you mean by that? I went to church whenever my parents went to church, which really wasn't quite often. You know, they were believers, but they didn't go to church that much. So we went not because we were seeking a personal, intimate relationship with God and Jesus Christ. We went out of an obligation to just go to church. And that's not what a lifestyle of Christianity is all about. And Christians fall into that rut. They fall, and we're going to look at a rut tonight. They fall into that trap of going to church because if I just, I just need to go to church because I go to church. And that's not it. That's not the lifestyle of Christianity. I think Pastor was talking about this yesterday or today in healing school about, you know, the transformation that happens when you become a Christian. And then there's a lifestyle trans trans uh, transformation that goes along with it. So we started to look at, at some keys of cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity. And I just want to run through them real quickly, and then we'll pick up again where we left off, and I'm going to do my best to land the plane. Amen? So number one. We talked about this. I talked about this when we opened up with praise and worship. The word of God in James chapter 1, verse, let's see where we are. I'm going back and bouncing around a little bit, but I, I think it's important. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and we're not going to read that for sake of time, says that we're going to face things. We're going to face trials and tribulations. It's a forewarning that not one of us is going to get through this time here on earth without facing any challenges. So challenges are absolutely going to come. But number one thing we looked at is we need to be built up in God's word before circumstances ever come. And we compared that to, um, to an army going into battle without their weapons, without their ammunition, without their gear, without their food, without all of their logistical support, an army would never go into battle. 
But yet as Christians, we do. We go in unarmed and unprepared for the things that the enemy tries to throw at us. Why is that? Because we don't spend time cultivating our lifestyle of Christianity. It's your life. It's your lifestyle, right? And we go into every fight the enemy throws at us completely unarmed and unprepared. And guess what? We lose. We lose the battle. But yet the word of God tells us that we have the victory through Christ Jesus, that we're more than overcomers, that we are an overcomer. So what's missing in that? How, how, how can we lose if we are something? It's because we aren't built up in the word of God. We don't know what belongs to us. So how can we fight for what's ours if we don't know what belongs to us? It's that simple. We've got to know what belongs to ours. We got to know that hit healing, that, that supernatural uh, uh, healing belongs to us. That sickness, illness, and disease is under the curse that Christ redeemed you from. We gotta know that poverty, lack of any kind is under the curse that Christ redeemed you from. But we, if we don't know our ammunition, if we don't know our weaponry, how can we put up a fight, amen? I wanted to, and I, I realized last week, right after I got done ministering, that I left out something that I wanted to share with you guys, and it was something out of my own life. And years ago, as, a, as a really seeking the Lord again for the first time, and I know I've alluded to this the last couple of weeks, is I've de I dealt with severe anxiety. And when I tell you severe anxiety, I mean severe anxiety. So, severe anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, that led to you know uh, compulsive thoughts and th anybody who's ever battled that, I, I know where you're coming from. Been there, done that. Had the bumper sticker and the T-shirt, burned them through the Word of God. Actually, God burned them for me. But when I I got a hold of um, being built up in the Word, overcome that circumstance, and I realized what belonged to me in Christ. You know, and this was even starting as a new believer. I got a hold of, you know, um, be anxious for nothing. You know, to, that, that the Bible is pretty specific about not giving me, a, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, right? And, and all the scriptures that went along with anxiety. So what I literally used to do, and Jody can attest to this, and I should have brought them. I actually have some of them at home still. I used to get five by seven index cards, and I used to write every scripture that dealt with anxiety, fear, and worry on those cards and carry them in my pocket. And every time that would rise up inside me, the enemy would try and come against my thought life with something that would make me ax you know, um, anxious or, or bring on, try to trigger a compulsive thought, I would just take it captive, throw it down and read that scripture and replace what the enemy was trying to bring with the word. Now, and, uh, leading up to that point, I tried everything in the natural realm to combat this situation I was dealing with. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with doctors and therapists, that's all fine. You know, that's a supplement to your own time in the word. Absolutely get a good, you know, if you need a good Christian, you know, therapist to kind of help you walk through some life skills, there's nothing wrong with that. But your life skills should be from the word of God, amen? Because that's your life style. So literally for me, all of that, you know, over time, didn't happen overnight, but over time, putting the word to work in my life. What I've been talking about is applying the word to my circumstance. All of a sudden, that stuff just slowly, slowly, slowly went away. It dissipated. Why? Because God really didn't give me a spirit of fear. I was no reason for me to be anxious for anything. Because why? God's got my back. God's my provider. God's my source. And I had the revelation of that, that, man, there is nothing to be anxious about. Absolutely nothing. Amen? So I, I wanted to bring that back up. I had forgotten to. And it's a great reminder. If you're dealing with something out there today, if it is anxiety, if it is worry, you know, we're, we're still dealing with this thing, you know, COVID-19, if that's got you fearful, if that's got you worried, there's something else that was going on before that's still lingering. If you're dealing with, you know, health challenges. Write down those scriptures on a note card. Carry them around. Anytime that enemy tries to bring a negative thought to your mind, say, no, no, devil, I am not taking it. I physically cast this down, and I am going to replace it with the word. Amen? 
Right, Jody, it is written, exactly. Just like, just like Jesus did in the wilderness when the, when the devil tried to come against him, right? And then secondly, we looked at speaking the word over your circumstances, which is exactly what I was just talking about. So we have to continue to do that as a life, cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity. We have to speak things. We are to call things that are not as though they are. You know, if you've got a zero balance in your checking account tonight, that doesn't have to stand and last unless you allow it to. Amen? You know, if, you, if you're a giver, you're a sower, right? We were talking about that in the offering tonight. If you've got seed in the ground, call it in, man. Call that harvest in. You know, ministering angels, go forth and bring in the harvest of all the seed I've sown in Jesus' name. Because your word says, you shall supply all my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's speaking the word over yourself. If you're dealing with sickness, illness, and disease, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I am healed. Make it personal. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So then we looked at, remember the words we speak have power, which all go hand in hand, which is exactly what we're talking about. Every single thing, Every single, every single thing we speak out has power. You know, and, and that's a sticking point for me because I hear so many Christians I know that love God so much, right? But they're speaking, the, they're speaking death over their lives. We don't want that to, we never, ever, I never want to hear that. You know, I know they love God and they're wondering why, you know, <clears throat> that thing they're believing God for hasn't shown up but yet they're magnifying by speaking their circumstance and then grumbling and complaining about why they don't have the victory. And they wonder why they're not getting it. You know, there's sometimes, and my wife will tell you this, if you get a chance, well, you'll get a chance to see her in person soon. When I get to the, and look, I am not above having a fit of carnality. It's real, right? What, I'm not a human being? I'm not, my wife's looking at me like, I'm not a human being that I'm not capable of falling into or, or, or the enemy trying to bring that to my life. Of course I am. So, so many times she'll tell you, I'll just sit like, I'll sit across from her now that we're working from home and I'll be like, I am just going to put myself, just like a little kid, in timeout. I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm not going to say a word because I got to get a hold of it, right? I got to get a hold of it and then turn around and speak the word over what's going on. So we've, we've got to speak the word and not grumble and complain, amen? And we were talking about this last week, and, and this bears repeating. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 8, Moses forewarns the people that they weren't grumbling and complaining against Moses for delivering them out of Egypt, right? But, and, and they were being supernaturally provided for, you know, in the wilderness, you know, with food to eat, their clothes grew with them, the Red Sea parted, you know, they had a cloud by day and fire by night. God was supernaturally providing, yet they were complaining. Well, who were they really complaining against? They were complaining against God. Exodus chapter 16, verse 8 says, also Moses said, this shall be seen this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, in the morning, bread to the full, for the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Not a place you guys want to find yourselves in. Amen? And this is where we left off last week, which was always remain teachable and flexible. Now, if you're believing God for something, maybe it's your own ministry. I don't know. Not very, I believe, well, we know everybody here is called to ministry. And whether it's here at the church, you know, as, as part of the helps ministry, music ministry, children's ministry, ushers, we're getting back here soon, guys. I know God's putting stuff as you're sitting home in this quarantine, for lack of a better word. I bet God's dealing with so many of you about getting involved when we get back. And I just literally just felt that in my spirit right now, hadn't given it any thought today, but I believe that's going on right now. And you might say, well, I'm not talented in that area. Okay, what's wrong with that? God calls, then he equips, so often, right? 
Why? Because if you were already talented in that area, where would the faith be to do what you've been just called to do? Amen? What I do up here, whether you guys believe this or not, those of you who are very close to me know that I'm shy by nature. Right? Jody will tell you, I don't even want to call Domino's and order a pizza. I just don't like it. I can do business. Don't ask me why. I can talk to anybody in business. I can do this because God's called me and anointed me to do it, but, but in reality, I'm shy. Doing that whole music thing is way outside my comfort zone. You guys have no idea, but I do everything unto the glory of God because God said, you got to do it, right? So I know there's people out there right now that God's dealing with that's asking you to remain teachable and flexible, and flexible means you might have to step out in an area that you never thought you would ever be in. But isn't that like God? Isn't that like God to stretch us, to mold us and shape us into who he wants us to be? Especially when we're cultivating this lifestyle of Christianity and we're seeking him and we're looking to getting to know his ways and his, his characteristics and his promises that all of a sudden he just goes, I'm going to open up that door for them. I'm going to call them to the music ministry. I'm going to call you to the children's church, to the ushers, to the greeters. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I don't know. I mean, but our flexibility is when we say, Lord, here I am, use me. Doesn't sound like something I'd be good at, but if you called me, I'm going to step through that door. Amen? So always remain teachable and flexible. How else do we cultivate a lifestyle of Christianity? And I just need my iPad to work. Well, first and foremost, we need to stay plugged into our local church. Now, this go, and obviously what I opened up with tonight was talking about people fading away from the live streams. But why is that? Well, things are starting to change. I, you know, I can feel a shift in my spirit that we're coming down the road of recovery, and I am never going to use and I'm only using it tonight to tell you what, what I'm never going to use. I am never going to use that term new normal again because that, that denotes something bad. That denotes something less of a life that, you know, that we had before. No, God wants us to have life till the full, till it overflows. Amen? So that's not a new normal. God's new normal is going over the top for us. It's over and above. But my concern is seeing people fade away because, you know, things are loosening up a little bit. They open the beaches. Don't get me wrong. I don't understand how you can wait in line for a sandwich at Wawa, but you can't go to a restaurant. But that's a whole other story. But my point being is people start to get comfortable. They start to feel like, okay, things are loosening up, and they're starting to slip away from, like, the live stream. And the same thing happens to Christians in the church, meaning in the physical building, attending services at the church. Well, you'd be like, Pastor, what do you mean by like that? Here's what I mean. I've seen so many people over our 13 years here, 13 years here at Abundant Grace, right? Come in. Problems. Things are going bad. Get the word starting to be fed into them. They're, they're starting to apply it. They're starting to spend time in it. But then that situation that they were having so much trouble with all of a sudden starts to ease up, getting a little bit better. But rather than like what we talked about, stay built up in the word because that next problem is going to come. No, they retreat. They pull away. We see them six months later in the same state they were in six months before. That is not a lifestyle of Christianity. That's what we used to call back in the 12-step um, meetings and, the, and the, you know, the recovery group meetings. That's a foxhole kind of existence. You're there. God's there for you in an emergency when you need him. But when everything starts going good, you take your foot off the brake and you're just out back in the way it was. And you wind up pulling away from the body of believers you were supposed to be with. I want to read you a scripture. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 4, and this is out of the Amplified. For just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we who are many are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on each other. Now, that's a scripture in my heart, I believe, and we've heard is preached, deals with everybody has a part to play inside the local church. But to me, it also tells me that we're supposed to be here to help each other, right? To minister to each other. You know, so often, whoever's ministering from this pulpit, whoever it is, myself, Pastor Anthony, Pastor Eddie, whoever, guest speaker, I, you know, I can't always get one-on-one -on -one with everybody, but you know everybody you're friends with inside the church. You can help them right where they're at today. Amen? And our goal is to ha get people to stay plugged in, not when just things are not going well, when things are going good. You know, I always say that's a dangerous time to have. And you know, I, I, I want everybody to have a great journey through life, right? But when things are going good, we have a tendency to put our walk with God on cruise control, and it's an afterthought. We're not constantly seeking because we're not going through anything, so we start to ease off. And it's like that Casting Crown song, the slow fade. Amen? So, cultivating the lifestyle of Christianity means you've got to stay plugged in to the local church. Amen? Now I'm going to go something that may be a little bit, where am I going? Well, we kind of covered it. It's not, it's not too rough, but we need to be willing and we need to be obedient. All of us want a manifestation of some a victory of whatever we believe in God for to happen in our lives. But the willing and the obedient will receive it. Amen? We've got to be willing to do whatever God's told us to do, and we've got to be obedient to do it. You know, I learned early on, Actually, I'm going to read this verse of scripture. And me and Jody were talking about this today, but not in the context of this message. And it's in John chapter 5, and it's verse 1 through 9. It's about the story about the man at the pool of Bethesda, right? And there's two things going on in this story. You've got a guy that's been in a condition for a lot of years, wanting to be healed, and then the healer comes to him, and he makes a lot of excuses as to why he can't get healing. But at the end of this verse of scripture to me is willingness and obedience. So John chapter five, verse, uh, actually we're going to start in verse one. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches and these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity. 38 years, a long time. Some of you are dealing with a circumstance in your life, a long time. And remember, I'm talking in the context of being willing and obedient. So I had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And so many of us tonight are dealing with a condition that's been around for a long time, and the master standing in front of us knowing our condition. There's nothing we're going through that's going to surprise Jesus. That simple. He knows it, and he knows what condition we're in. And he's asking you a question tonight. He's asking us a question tonight. Do you want to be made well? And the sick man initially answers like so many of us answer. When God puts on our heart to do something, and maybe that sickness, that disease, the illness, that thing you're facing tonight, God's asking you to do something about it, right? And, and it might seem different. Maybe, I'm not saying maybe. He's probably asking you to go deeper with him. You know, Miss Carol had an expression that I, me and Jody got a hold of that when we started coming here years ago, which was things are going wacky in your life, double time it in the word. 
Double time it and triple time it. Maybe God's telling you to do that right now. But just like this guy in verse seven, this is your answer. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. But while I'm coming and other steps down before me, Jesus didn't ask him for an explanation why he can't be healed. He asked him a question. Do you want to made, be made well? Are you willing and obedient? to be made well. Will you listen to me and believe me? And will you do what I'm about to tell you to do? Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And what happened? The guy did it. Immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. That's a whole nother story. But you see, what I'm, you see where I'm going with that? We have to be willing and obedient. We're believing God for stuff, but we're not willing and obedient to do what God's telling us to do. They don't work hand in hand. That'll get you more of the same old thing. We've got to be willing and obedient. And I'm still talking under the cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity. Because what's a lifestyle of Christianity? God puts something on your heart to do. You do it immediately. You know, and I get there's times where you're praying about stuff and maybe you're not sure, and that's okay. We were there too, we're there often. And you know, I always said this is a Keith Moore quote, if it was God today, it'll be God tomorrow. That's okay. You know, you're just not 100% sure. You're not, um, you're not, you are not. You don't have a release for something you're believing God for. Sounds good, looks good, but the spirit of God is like, you're not 100%, you know, sold out to what God's telling you to do because you think it might be you then you can wait. There's nothing wrong with that. But so many times we wait when we know it's God. You know, I mean, if God's telling you go deeper with me, does that sound like something you really need that much confirmation about? Doesn't to me. You know, God all wants us all to go deeper with him. Amen? What's another thing we must do to cultivate a lifestyle of Christianity? We got to resist the devil, right? But you guys know me. I love that scripture in James chapter 4, verse 7. But so many of us forget the first part of the scripture. And this goes along with being willing and obedient comes the submission part to resist the devil. We've got to submit to God, resist the devil, then he will flee. Amen? We can't expect to stand against the things of the enemy when we're doing the things of the enemy. Get me where I'm, get where I'm going with that? Because actually, if you take it back to the verse of Scripture, a house divided against itself can't stand, right? So meaning we've got to make that division from the things that the enemy is doing in our life and what we might be doing to aid him. Amen. We've got to we got to submit to God, the things of God, the ways of God, the lifestyle of Christianity. And if you don't take it back to the word, know what's yours, know what a lifestyle of Christianity is all about. It does us no good. Amen. We have to take a daily spiritual inventory every day. Now, for those of you who ever went through a 12-step ministry or familiar with them, they always talk about taking a daily spiritual inventory. But that's a great thing to do for every Christian. And what am I, what am I talking about when I'm take, talking about taking a daily spiritual inventory? We need to be looking at our own lives daily. Things like, what am I allowing into my life that I shouldn't? Am I exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience. I failed miserably at a lot of that today because I was allowing people to get to me. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If not, why not? Right? If I'm not exhibiting those things, why am I not? Do I feel like I'm in a spiritual rut? And you know what? There's nothing wrong to admit that. I think we've all had dry seasons in our lives that felt like we were going through the motions. But in that book I mentioned last week, in that class we used to teach here, The Armor Bearer, the author, Terry Nance, I'll never forget this. He has a quote of what he describes a rut is. If you're in a rut, a rut is nothing more than an elongated grave. If you stay in that rut, it's going to lead you down a road that's not good. So we've got to look at ourselves every day in the mirror and say, 
hey, is there something I shouldn't be doing? You know, is there something God's been dealing with me about? It might not be something that's bad, right? Is there something that's, you know, I'm not exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. I'm, there's no love. There's no joy. I'm not peaceful. Then why not? Start asking yourself questions. Start asking the Holy Spirit to show you what you need to change. See, that's a cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity, relying on God to help, not yourself and other people in the world. Amen? I saw a quote today, and it was a quote designed, it was a quote about people, why they fail in business. And the quote was, the reason why people fail in business is they take advice of their friends, their families, and their neighbors. That's why they fail in business. And then I turned it around and said, well, the only way to succeed in business is take the advice of the word of God and God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus in prayer. Amen? That's the only way to succeed. Now, this is the challenge part. What else do we need to cultivate a lifestyle of Christianity? We need to check our love walk. Now, that's where I blew it today because everybody was getting a little wacky today. You know, I personally believe, dealing with people every day, that people are experiencing some challenges by having been quarantined for this long, and they're getting antsy right? And they're getting a little angry and they're getting a little worn out of sitting around doing nothing. And they're getting a little bit of, um, what's the term? They're getting uh, stir crazy or they're getting like a little cabin fever. So people are acting a little bit on edge, right? But we have to check our love walk. Our love walk shouldn't change because people are changing, right? We're supposed to be immovable. I mean, did Jesus's love walk change when people were coming against him to persecute him? No right? Because that's not a characteristic of God. So if, you know, I did, a, I did a message years ago on how to love people in an unlovable world. And the world, I got a newsflash for you, isn't going to get more lovable. It's going to get more unlovable. So what do we have to do to check our love walk? We got to remember it's a verb. I'm not talking about feeling love. I'm talking about Love is an action. Just like for God so loved the world, God did something. He put love in action. He gave us Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, another key question, if you're struggling tonight in an area, right, you're not really living the lifestyle of Christianity, or maybe you think you are but I want to really check your hearts on something in here that's contained inside of the love walk. And that is, are you harboring any unforgiveness towards anybody right now? Amen? Because if you are, then you're not really walking in love because you still have unforgiveness in your heart. You know, I mean, there, there was somebody I knew years ago, and uh, this person would always ask me, like, Oh, dealing with sickness and illness and disease constantly, right? And, and they asked me, and they said, why do you think that is? And I asked them, are you still, uh, still have some issues with so-and-so? And they're like, oh, that, I, they could die for all I care, blah, blah, like that harsh. And I'd be like, and I looked this person straight in the face, and I said, and you wonder why you're dealing with sickness and illness? And they were like, yeah, whatever. And I don't know what happened. I haven't seen him in years. But my point being is cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity is loving people and immediately trying, because I say trying, because forgiveness can be a process, but immediately forgiving people in faith, meaning you're going to need to work that out over a period of time sometimes, especially people that have really, really hurt you. I get that. I'm not denying that. But part of our love walk is being able to forgive. Amen? What's another cultivation step in cultivating the lifestyle of Christianity? Believe you receive. You know, if you're praying, right, and you believe, you know, the Bible in Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will, will have them. But so many times we waver in standing and waiting for the things of God to manifest. You know, when you pray for something, when you're praying for a financial breakthrough, or when you're praying for, you know, something, whatever it is to manifest in your life, 
Do you have to pray that prayer over and over again? Or do you pray that prayer, believe you receive, and just continue down the road of thanking God every day for it? Amen? You know, I forget who it was, what minister it was. I always used the example of the, uh, the kid that run to, run to their parents and say, I want those new Nikes. Well, not today, but we're working on it. We'll get them for you. And the kid comes back and goes, uh, I really want those new Nikes. When am I going to get them? And uh, not today. And then the third day, the kid comes back and goes, yo, where are my Nikes? Does the, does the, the parents want to hear that from the child? Or they want to hear, um, you know, mom, dad, I'd like to have a new pair of Nikes. Honey, we're working on it, and we're doing our very best. And that kid comes back the next day and goes, Mom, thank you for working on those Nikes. I can't wait to have them. It's a different change, right? It's a different whole attitude. Amen? Yeah. Another step in cultivating the lifestyle of Christianity is feelings. And what do I mean by feelings? Don't let your feelings dictate your decisions. So many times... You know, and, and our feelings are really our mind, will, and our emotions, right? And we allow our, our feelings to override what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us to do. And years ago, I'll never forget it. I could tell you where I was when I wrote this down. I was preparing a message for the soup kitchen, and I asked God to give me like an acronym or give me um, an acrostic for feelings. And this is what he showed me. I'll never forget it because it was like something that happened at like five o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. But he gave me this acrostic for feelings. And it's the F is false evidence appearing real. The E is entering our life. The second E is establishing a stronghold. The L is leaving us with N. The I is intensely. The N is negative attitude despite having the G godly, and the S, surplus. surplus. So what are our feelings? False evidence appearing real. Fear. That's our feelings most often is fear. False evidence appearing real, entering our life, establishing a stronghold, leaving us with an intensely negative attitude despite having a godly surplus. And what is that godly surplus? It's the victory. It's the victory you already have. You already have a surplus of victory in your life because Jesus already took care of everything we already need. But yet, we allow our feelings rather than our spirit dictate what we do. Amen? Does that make sense to you guys? I hope it does because that's a big one. I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Well, what's a stronghold? It's a fortress. The enemy tries to come in and establish a fortress in our mind. Amen? And we need to take that thought captive so he cannot establish a fortress or a stronghold. Amen? Another step, and we're, we're bringing, this, bringing this to a close. We're, we got two more steps and we're good. Keep yourself from pride and offense. Amen? Pride will be more concerned about the things of men of the world rather than the things of God. Pastor Eddie, I'm not going to, he's been doing a dynamite job. He had been doing a dynamite job of being humble when he was talking about um, the centurion and, and that whole uh, series he did. Go back and watch that if you want to talk about humility or learn about humility. What else do we need to do? We need to live in a no judgment zone. Take time to get to know somebody before you make a snap decision about their character because of what you've observed or what somebody else has told you. This has happened to me in my Christian walk where so-and-so, and, -so, and I, I entertained it and I should never have, told me something about somebody, then I met him and realized the person who told me was the one who was off their rocker. Amen? And lastly, when we want to talk about cultivating a lifestyle of Christianity, and there's a lot more things to do, but these are the ones God put on my heart, is avoid gossip. Gossip stops when it reaches one obedient Christian. What do I mean by that? So-and-so tells so-and-so about so-and-so, and then when it reaches that obedient Christian, it stops there. Don't play into it, guys. You never know what somebody's going through. Live in a no-judgment zone. Amen? And really, what this all points back to is spending time with God. You know, that's what the 166-hour message was all about, was about spending personal, intimate time 
in the word of God. Fellowship, prayer, seeking, changing, putting it into application, and cultivating that lifestyle of Christianity. Can you guys say amen? Well, glory to God, we're so glad you joined us here. Um, I know Pastor Reddy put out a voice message last week when President Trump was talking about you know, pressing upon the governors to open up the churches as quickly as possible. No new guidance on that front yet, but we will keep you posted. Um, we're gonna close out in prayer, and then I'm, again, I'm so happy you guys have joined us this evening. Don't forget we have a healing school tomorrow and Friday, 10.30 uh, a.m. every Tuesday through Friday. We've got Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. So, Father God, we thank you that we could come here together virtually, Lord, that we could spend time in your word, fellowship with you through your word, Father. And I thank you that everybody tonight would just go down that, that deeper walk with you, Lord, tonight, and that they would cultivate that lifestyle of Christianity. And if anybody's struggling in an area that maybe they feel like they don't have time to spend with God, open their eyes, Father. Show them that they have time. Let everybody who God that you're dealing with tonight, that in an area of being willing and obedient, to, to rise up and do that for you, Father. And we thank you for that. We thank you for everything you've done this evening and what you're going to continue to do in all our lives. And we thank you for in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your one Wednesday night. And we'll see you tomorrow morning in healing school. And we'll see you Sunday morning.